Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Ian Tuttle of National Review is in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis, so a little bit less depressing than Monday, but the bad and the crazy are pretty darn depressing, and we'll get to all of them in just a moment. Just a quick sports note uh, as we begin today. A lot of news today, and rightly so, about the passing of legendary Tennessee women's Head basketball coach Pat Summit due to the awful scourge of dementia at the age of 64. Another one that happened today that probably won't get as much attention, but since those of us who are football fans here at the Three Martini Lunch will point out, Buddy Ryan also died today, 82 years old. He was the architect of the famed 46 defense for the Chicago Bears, the legendary 1985 Super Bowl champion Chicago Bears, which is my team. And uh, Ian, I, I want to point out for those who are Jets fans, I don't know if you are, but Jim is, that uh, Buddy Ryan also has a connection to the Jets. And it's not that his son was their coach recently, because I know that won't provide much comfort to the Jets. <laughs> but he was a defensive assistant for the 1968 Jets, which, of course, won Super Bowl three. So Buddy Ryan had a big huh. role in the Jets getting their lone Super Bowl ring. So there you go. I didn't know that, and I hadn't seen that he'd. Uh, I hadn't seen that he passed away. You're right. That's uh, that's getting swamped in uh, uh, the rest of the news. Absolutely, and there's plenty of other news uh, that we need to get to. Starting with the good martini. It's good to have a good martini today. And the official Select Benghazi Committee has released its report. Uh, the Democrats tried to jump the gun earlier this week by saying there's nothing new. It's all political. It's all designed to hurt Hillary and and help Donald Trump because, you know, Donald Trump had such a huge role to play in Benghazi. But Trey Gowdy and the majority of Republicans released their report on Tuesday morning. They talked about all the warnings, all the requests for help that fell on deaf ears for greater security at the Benghazi consulate. Uh, That, of course, flew in the face of the al-Qaeda is on the run message that the Obama-Biden campaign was running on at the time. There, there, of course, is the lie about the video, the lie throughout the Susan Rice talking points, uh, as well as the president and Hillary Clinton immediately following the attack. And then, of course, there's what happened in the middle. And Trey Gowdy was uh, not mincing any words about how the administration left American heroes out to dry. Nothing could have reached Glenn Doherty and Ty Woods before they were killed because nothing was ever going toward Glenn Doherty and Ty Woods. And it is worth noting that that statement would be true had the mortar attacks taken place at 7.15 a.m. or 9.15 a.m. or even at lunchtime on the 12th. Because at the time those two Americans were killed, not a single wheel of a single U.S. military asset had even turned toward Libya. Mike Pompeo, who was also on the committee, he's a congressman from Kansas, basically saying this was a failure at the highest levels of government. They were asleep at the switch when a crisis was playing on in a hot spot halfway around the world. And so, Ian, just the stuff we already knew even before this committee got impaneled was was, uh, an indictment on this administration and on the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee. But the idea that we didn't learn anything, Trey Gowdy just pointed out today that it was a Qaddafi militia that actually ended up helping to save American lives that day because nobody else was coming other than uh, the security forces who went even though they were told not to. We got the Sidney Blumenthal emails uh, talking about how all the, all the business interests that were going on in Libya. And, of course, uh, we found out about the Hillary Clinton private server through all this. So a lot came out in this investigation, and even the stuff we already knew is incredibly condemning. That's right. So basically what this this report um, has given us and I certainly haven't read the whole thing. It's 800 pages. That's a weekend reading project. But what it does is adds uh, details and, and uh, really fleshes out a lot of what we already knew. And what it does is it, it intensifies, in, uh, in my opinion, having read the summary and seen what's, what's coming out of the reporting, it, it seems to intensify the indictment that, that already existed. There are a couple of points to make here. One is what we had effectively surmised at the beginning is now something we can confirm beyond a reasonable doubt, which is that the Obama administration in their decision not to do anything here um, from their inaction, not simply in failing to provide the requisite security for the forces and diplomatic personnel who were on the ground in advance of the attack, but also their failure on the night of the attack and their spin afterward was through and through a political decision. It was an election year 
two months out and uh, they made calculations that were based strictly on politics. One of the things that is pointed out in the report is that there was a meeting on the evening of the attack. There were 11 action items uh, in, in the, the meeting's agenda. Five were surrounding the video that Hillary Clinton already knew was a bogus excuse, but which she continued to trot out as well as Susan Rice uh, and the rest. So the focus here was, was entirely on the politics um, another <clears throat> little telling detail is one um, Marine commander whose who's, uh, unit was potentially going to be sent reported that they changed in and out of uniform four different times that evening because the oh, administration back in D.C. couldn't make up its mind whether it wanted them to go in uniform or not in uniform because of the political ramifications of having forces in uniform come into Libya and et cetera, et cetera. That's through and through rank politics. And, and the result was these dead Americans in, in Benghazi. It's a, um, a tragedy that had it been under a Republican administration would still be at the top uh, of the New York Times today. But everyone involved in this has a vested interest in making it go away, which is why Democrats have not only stonewalled uh, the investigation, as as the report points out, which they've most certainly done. I can I can say that having looked into this myself, but then doing what they they did also with Fast and Furious and with the IRS, um, which is trying to discredit it, discredit it as politicking by Republicans, and then saying, well, there's nothing new here. If you want a sort of good summary of the hypocrisy of the left on this. The counter report published by the Democrats on the committee, it's about 340 pages or so, mentions Donald Trump 23 times. <laughs> Donald Trump, who had absolutely nothing to do, who was not a, a speck in the uh, political world's eye uh, in September of, of 2012, comes up 23 times in the Democrats report. So that's just rank hypocrisy. Unfortunately, it's um, despite what we've learned, it's probably going to uh, to disappear fairly quickly because there's not the, um, the smoking gun that uh, some right wing types hope we'd find, and left wing types basically sort of created the necessity of. You know, it's it's a sort of a bunk investigation. You know, if if Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were not sitting there dipping bonbons um, <laughs> on the night of. That's not what happened, but what happened is, is in fact, mortifying. It's plenty bad enough, and the fact that we do know from this investigation that she emailed her daughter as well as a, a Libyan official saying it was not a protest over the video, it was uh, terrorism, and then she went with the lie days later, including to the face of the families of the victims at Dover. Don't ever forget that, that she did that. And uh, when she's out there now saying... My trust is at a low point right now because of wild accusations over the past 25 years. Well, guess what? You earned every one of those because there's a, at least a shred, if not a lot of truth, to every single one of those. And what we just described in her uh, encounter with the families could be the most odious of them all. There's a little quote um, that comes up in the report that I think is very telling. This is an interview with a, dip a diplomatic uh, security agent. He's recounting a conversation with the desk officer for diplomatic security in the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau. And he says, the security agent says, I told him this was a suicide mission. There was a very good chance that everybody here was going to die, that there was absolutely no ability here to prevent an attack, whatever. He said, everybody back in, back in D.C. knows that people are going to die in Benghazi and nobody cares and nobody is going to care until somebody does die. That was nine months before the attack. That, to me, is as searing an indictment as you could ask for of, of any administration um, uh, failing to protect the interests of Americans abroad. Absolutely unconscionable. All right, on to the bad martini now. That was our good martini uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we exposed that horrific, horrific uh, activity at the height of our leadership. But the bad martini goes right back to the Supreme Court. Yesterday, of course, we had the execrable ruling on the Texas abortion restrictions on requiring abortionists to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital and for abortion clinics to meet the safety and sanitary regulations of outpatient surgical clinics. Now the Supreme Court, apparently it's pro-abortion week at the high court because now, according to NBC News, 
The U.S. Supreme Court declined Tuesday to take up a challenge to a Washington state law that makes it illegal for pharmacies to refuse to dispense medications for religious reasons. The court's action, bypassing an invitation to wade back into the issues of religion and contraception, allows the state to enforce the law. In 2007, Washington state passed a law making it illegal to refuse to stock a drug for reasons of conscience. It was challenged by the owners of a supermarket-based pharmacy who declined on religious grounds to handle morning-after pills. The Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito actually issued a written dissent. Usually the court doesn't say anything when they reject a case, but they called the court's refusal to hear the case an ominous sign. They went on to say, if this is a sign of how our religious liberty claims will be treated in the years ahead. Those who value religious liberty have cause for concern. And they go on to say that there's more than a slight suspicion that the Washington law and the rules for enforcing it, quote, reflect antipathy toward religious beliefs that do not accord with the views of those holding the levers of government power, unquote. So, Ian, we're once again uh, at the point, we saw this a lot in the debate uh, over gay marriage and now with bathrooms and so forth. It's not enough that uh, they win a court case. Now you can't even believe what you want to believe and act according to your conscience. This is where the left takes things when they're in power and they win. Yeah, that's exactly right. This is a grim decision. And as Alito put it in, in the dissent, an ominous sign to be sure. So the Stormans. Uh, which are the family in in Washington, have a, a family-owned pharmacy, and they don't want to sell these drugs. And so they refer customers who want to buy the morning-after pill, uh, medications like that, to other pharmacies. Here's the reason that this is so ridiculous. There are 30 pharmacies that sell these drugs within five miles of the Stormans, uh, the Stormans pharmacy. But for the Washington regulatory bureaucracy, one dissenter was one too many. Now, 49 other states permit these referrals. The American Pharmacist Association supports basically religious conscience uh, exceptions like the ones that the Stormans have appealed to. But now Washington's left-wing bureaucrats are going to be able to force either the Stormans to, to sell these uh, drugs or to to shut down and find another line of work. So Alito is is absolutely correct in saying that it's it's very clear that there is an alternative motive behind behind this law. It's just it's it's rather explicit. I think it's worth pointing out too. There's a, a sort of parallel here with um, with bias in in classrooms. Um, which conservatives are constantly and, and rightly talking about. But one of the things about bias in classrooms, it's not just when a professor says something you know, f openly that's, that's biased, when they make ridiculous proclamations and the rest. It's also the fact that a whole lot of things they don't allow to come up. You know, they, they basically blackball whole subjects and topics. And you may never know about that in the course of a class. The same thing is, is happening at the court. Um, it's not just that we get bad decisions like the, one, like the ones yesterday, but their non-decisions are bad decisions too, very often. This probably precipitates, uh, especially if you get a, a sixth liberal judge in there, is not just that you're going to have a lot more lousy decisions like the abortion decision, but you're going to have a lot of um, petitioners with with good and important cases like the Stormans who are never able to get to the Supreme Court in the first place. Utterly disgraceful. Well, let's get into even more depressing news because the Democratic platform for 2016 is coming together. Ian, they've got plenty of horrific news on abortion as well as a number of other things that ought to make conservatives or any rational thinking American cringe. This is courtesy of Ben Shapiro over at the, the DailyWire.com. Uh, he's got nine issues here that uh, should be very alarming to most Americans. Number one, prosecuting people, prosecuting people who disagree with the theory of anthropogenic climate change. One of the passages is another joint proposal calling on the Department of Justice to investigate alleged corporate fraud on the part of fossil fuel companies who have reportedly misled shareholders and the public on the scientific reality of climate change was also adopted by unanimous consent. They also embrace the $15 minimum wage. They want to abolish the death penalty. I'm not sure that's a new one. Abortion for everyone. The platform also vows to oppose and seek to overturn 
all federal and state laws that impede a woman's access to abortion, including by repealing the Hyde Amendment, which at this point uh, blocks taxpayer funding of abortions through Medicaid, but they want to get rid of that. It also strongly supports the repeal of harmful restrictions that obstruct women's access to health care around the world, including the global gag rule and the Helms Amendment, that's overseas abortions, which bars U.S. assistance to other countries that provide safe legal abortions. They're big into protectionism. The Sanders people really dominating this platform. Uh, Number six, increase entitlement programs to bankrupt the country. They are going to fight every effort to cut, privatize, or weaken Social Security. In fact, they're going to expand it. They want amnesty for essentially everyone. They want to go and finish the job and and nationalize health care completely. And what uh, Ben calls increasing crime, Uh, the Democratic language says the current draft calls for ending the era of mass incarceration, shutting down private prisons, ending racial profiling, reforming the grand jury process, investing in reentry programs, banning the box to help give people a second chance, and prioritizing treatment over incarceration for individuals suffering addiction. So, Ian, obviously our crime rates will go down when nothing's a crime anymore. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, so from prosecuting to climate change to abortion literally on demand to everybody gets amnestied, I'm not sure what's the worst thing in here, but they're all pretty horrific. Where do you start? <laughs> First of all, it's it's worth acknowledging that the people who write these proposals are always, are always the largest uh, ideologues in the party. What's always instructive about platforms is that they really, because they're not widely circulated, they always sort of give you a better idea of what the party is actually about um, than than the rhetoric that you you get from actual party members. I mean, and abortion has been a great example of this. The Democratic Party platform has long been for unrestricted access to abortion. I think that, I believe the the uh, striking down the Hyde Amendment is is a new addition. Yes. Um, but you know, when when Hillary Clinton says, "Okay, I'm for exemptions late in the third trimester." What does that mean? A, it means nothing. But B, you can go to the platform and, and say, OK, are you in line with the with the party platform on this and really put, you know, put sort of a, um, a sharp point to that question? This platform is basically as far to the left as, as this party can manage while still having someone like Joe Manchin in it. And so this is just sort of the the whole progressive fantasy wish list in a little document. This goes to the final drafting committee. I assume they'll put a stamp of approval on on you know, 99% of this. So this is just uh, entirely indicative of, of where this party's head is at um, uh, philosophically, far more um, explicitly than you're ever going to get from any of the candidates. Um, and what that means is they're effectively a party that is now against religious liberty and for repealing the First Amendment. Uh, there's no other way to interpret repealing the Hyde Amendment or endorsing prosecuting climate change skeptics other than as you know, explicit measures against religious liberty as such and against free speech uh, protections as such. That's where this party is. If we had a, uh, repu- re- a competent uh, Republican candidate, this would be, a, <laughs> this would be a, a great point to hit for the next several months. Ian, it does beg the question, though, given what we know the Democrats want to do and given where Hillary is and uh, her horrific uh, record across the board, is it worth holding the nose Uh, just to push the Republican platform? Because a lot of folks say, well, you might just vote down ballot, but if you don't vote for president, a lot of people won't end up voting at all. And uh, while you're not actively assisting with the election of Hillary Clinton, I hate that argument, you could be tacitly hurting uh, the Republicans, obviously. I still maintain that people should should vote their conscience and simply because um, Donald Trump might be better on certain things than Hillary Clinton was doesn't make Donald Trump therefore acceptable, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that he meets the threshold of, take myself as an example, would or could conscionably support. But if you can make the platform sort of a, um, a point of discomfort for Hillary, which I think you can on a number of things, for instance, Actually, try actually trying to repeal the Hyde Amendment again. To emphasize, this is a wish list. Actually trying to do so, I think, would be a massive battle, because it's not just abortion access. It's basically forcing it. it well, it literally is forcing people who oppose it to pay for other people's abortions. Um, I mean, that would just be a massive fight. And if I think you can, if you can prod her on those points, which um, 
which a Republican House, assuming we can keep it, uh, would certainly be able to do, then while the, the party is philosophically at the point of this platform and it makes for good a good list of things you can hit back on, there are elements in here that are probably so politically sensitive in sort of a practic from a practical standpoint um, that that you could temper uh, the the worst excesses here that's my that's my little glint of optimism there <laughs> oh we got some cheer to end the yeah there you go to end there the day go. on with this horrific <laughs> platform and the Supreme Court and all this other stuff but we did get a good cheer. martini today and, and hope springs eternal for tomorrow Ian talk to you then all right. Thanks, Greg. Ian Tuttle of National Review. And for Jim Garrity today, he will be back tomorrow. Join us then for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch.